Welcome to Climate Channel, Climate Conversation, Climate Action with Kamal Choudhury. Climate Action Pathways, episode 46. In this episode, we are going to discuss the climate situation across the globe. The climate week in New York, climate COP, pre-COP at Milan and on our road to Glasgow COP26. Climate is changing all over the world and IPCC assessment report in its sixth hmm, version working group one pointed out that the whole world, the planet is a red alert. We need to speed up, we need to cut back our emissions, carbon emissions, steeply, sharply, if we want to keep alive 1.5 degree Paris Agreement climate goal. So we must cut back our emissions. We have to have more ambitious nationally determined contributions and disease of the countries, various countries, especially G20 countries. And also have to fix the Paris rule book, Article 6, common time frame, transparency and accountability mechanism, so on and so forth, climate adaptation, climate adaptation goals, climate finance, climate finance for adaptation as well as mitigation, and also what about loss and damage, because loss and damage is also uh, on the rise. Adaptation cost is on the rise, so how to change the gear, how to cope the situation, how to avert catastrophes, how to avert droughts, inundations across the globe, not in the, only in the most vulnerable countries, but also in the developing countries, but also in the developed world. So without much ado, I would now like to uh, start the climate conversation episode 46 with Kate Iskane. Kate is an old hand and he has been in this process for many months. I would now like to ask Kate to start his take. Great, thank you very much, uh, Kwam Rul. It's, it's a pleasure to be on this really interesting program that you have. I've been following it for, for quite a while and really enjoyed the, the important contributions that uh, you and your, your team have, are making. I think this is this is obviously such an important issue, and the effects globally are are so significant, and uh, you know it, it, it it's so mixed in with geopolitics, with all sorts of soft power issues, but you know we need to strip away all of that and get down to the very basic realities, which is that you know our our economic, social, and environmental futures are all significantly threatened. It's an intertwined uh, problem, what we call a wicked problem. Uh, and the essence of that is the behavior of a small part of the planet over the last 200 years. But unfortunately, the, the people paying the, the most expensive prices for this damage are not those uh, that created it in the first place very often. Um, they are communities in uh, very maybe rural areas in uh, as, as, are, as are called least developed nations. Well, I hate the word <laughs> developed uh, relating to that. And, and actually in the, many of these countries, they have been practicing good sustainable uh, behavior uh, for million for, for, for thousands of years. You know, the, the, if, if we look at some of the smaller uh, indigenous populations, for instance, on the planet, they have been living within their limits. Um, whereas we have somehow over the last maybe 200 years in the, in the West, 
especially, really, really got away from that and, and lived in a very selfish way. And, and the basis of that's quite interesting. I, I've looked into this in a lot of detail. Why did we take this path? And it really came from a separation between nature and ourselves. You know, we, we became very consumed with using nature and, and, and treating it as something that was really just a resource. It was just something that we could utilize. And, and we lost our respect for it, really. I mean, if you look at a lot of the indigenous populations, they, they show great respect for nature. They show a great reverence for nature, uh, both spiritually, but also in their practical ways. You know, in, in, uh, in, in, in their, the, the way that they approach things, we call traditional knowledge. And if we look at the traditional knowledge of, of much of the planet, um, it is deeply ingrained and the earth system is at the center of everything. And then society and its activities, its economics, um, come out from beyond that. But they're, at the heart of it is the earth system. And, and, and that's what we've really lost um, over time, unfortunately, uh, in the West especially. We have lost this, this um, respect for uh, what nature gives to us and, uh, and how it empowers us. And it's got to such an extent that we are now damaging it, of course, in very significant ways. So I think, you know, COP26 is a crucial thing. We've heard this from, from everybody. It's an essential moment, but it's coming at a time when we're, we're in a very difficult situation. With this massive pandemic, which has been horrific, killing millions of people. We, we've got a, a, an economic crisis stemming from the expenditure needed to um, get the populations of different countries through this in terms of uh, you know, supporting them when they're off work and so on. And so the finances are tight. Um, the pandemic is still with us. It's not gone yet. And, um, it, it's, and there's also geopolitical tensions, as, as we're aware of, um, globally. And so all of these things are playing in to make this a very tense event indeed. Um, you know, how is it going to play out? But, you know, the, 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 the noises coming from some of the main leaders are positive. We've seen some useful things recently. Turkey is now ratifying the Paris Agreement, which is great. Uh, we see um, India, you know, committing to um, come out with their um, sort of budget, carbon budget for, for, for the next few years. Um, and we see the US now committing more money uh, to the cause, or promising to. So, so you know, and Brazil also is, is, is not going to block the carbon markets concept, well, that's what they've announced. So th these are good things. Um, so uh, let's just hope that we need everyone there, we need China there especially. Let's hope everybody gets into Glasgow and this meeting is, is, is a real success. And it's building on Paris, of course. There's a lot of good things in Paris, but this meeting is the one that needs to transform that into a reality. And, uh, and that's an essential thing. Do you want me to keep talking about a few things or do you want to come in, uh, Conro? Uh, yeah, I think uh, say what you say uh, are saying, uh, yes, uh, there are positive movements, uh, even from Joe Biden, hmm, uh, compared to Trump administrations, uh, uh, say, living uh, from uh, Paris Agreement, they are rejoining. Uh, but with that rejoining, mm, there are some mm, boost in the process. But no, do you think it is sufficient enough uh, to uh, reach 1.5 degree global goal? Uh, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, you see, see Yes, I, I don't yeah, think it is. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it is sufficient at all. Um, you know, I think we're falling well short, to be honest with you. Yeah. I still think that we're not, you know, we're not taking this as seriously as we need to. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. th this is this is uh, potentially a crisis beyond all crises. You know, yeah. it, 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 the, the devastation that the unraveling of the climate will cause is, is you know, almost beyond, you know, comparison, really. <laughs> In, in terms of the potential global effects. You know what I mean? We, you know, we, we, we don't, don't need to give lots of examples. We all know the examples, but you know, we're going to be increasing chaos. And we must remember that climate is a threat multiplier. That's a very important point. So it's not only going to be, you know, getting a lot warmer and you know, sea levels rising, all of these terrible things, the climate becoming much more chaotic. 
um, uh, destabilized. I actually prefer climate destabilization to climate change because you know it's not a directional change. It's going to be different in different parts of the world. And we're seeing that already. So I don't think we're taking it at all seriously enough. The other thing that concerns me is it's, it's, it mustn't be politicized. And it is, you know, at the moment. Uh, and I think ownership needs to be taken into a broader group of citizens and politicians and industry, you know, separate from the normal political fighting of a typical parliament, because that's not going to get progress. I think we need a unified government um, sort of department that, that, that unifies all of these groups. And I think that's so important. The politic politicization of this is not going to help at all. And so, so I, I'm hoping that COP26 will empower the citizens and, and there's a couple of ways they can do that. One is to give us the information about the supply chains, you know, a real detailed supply chain breakdown for everything we go to buy, you know, a proper ecological footprint and a sociological footprint. You know, so make sure that you know, the conditions are appropriate wherever people are working. You know, make sure that there's justice for those employees. Make sure also that, uh, you know, that we know what's in what we're, what we're buying. Because I think if, if you give the consumer the information, we can then make the judgments and the calls of what we buy and what we don't. And ultimately that will control, you know, that will control the business side of things. Because if we're not buying their products, then, you know, they're not going to succeed. And they'll be, we can force them to, be, to behave properly and an ecologically friendly way. So, you know, I think empowering the citizen is what I'd really like to see come out of this. I, I, we've got these citizens' assemblies in Scotland, but they were really, really not at all open to the citizens. You know, it was, you know, we got to watch stuff. I got invited to one of them. We got to watch stuff, but we didn't get to say anything. And, you know, it was just, it may as well have been a closed yeah. shop. So we need real citizen, you know, involvement. And I'd like to see that being a big emphasis and let us, take control, and I believe in, 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 in our ability to do that and in our desire to do that. I think most people on the planet recognize the problem. There's a small amount of people that don't, but most people, you know, will respond. But you see, uh, the uh, say small amount of people who are not recognizing uh, this problem, uh, they are, the, mm, say they are holding the major share of uh, carbon emissions yeah say they are mm, uh, because of their like, very luxurious lifestyles uh, are polluting our planet mm. Absolutely. and, and uh, they are against the nasser based solutions they are against uh, the change sweet change in the supply chain, in the in our consumption pattern, in our consumption, even in our production system. Mm. So, if we can cut back uh, emissions at the production level, mm -hmm. and then also the consumption level, then uh, in uh, say uh, aggregate we can mm, cut back our emissions. Uh, from our supply chain, from our uh, production system, and also consumption system, uh, and also changing behavior patterns of the uh, most luxurious people, most um, uh, richest people, and that also the poorest of the poor uh, will be rescued. Uh, say three to four billion people of the planet be rescued from climate catastrophe. They are on the hook of climate change. We have to take them off the hook mm. of climate change. So uh, it's a huge, huge challenge. Citizens' movements are required. Citizens' say, um, awareness hmm, should be mounted. And we have seen, uh, say, um, globally, uh, climate strikes. Yeah climate um, for futures they are um, also organizing so many events but still our powerful people our politicians our uh, say producers uh, especially our um, uh, say uh, production system um, is yet to tune with that process so how to uh, gear um, that 
towards a sustainable development. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, there, there's a combination of things. There's, there's, there's regulatory tools, obviously, where, 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 you know, governments can actually, you know, force industries to, to, to do particular things to, 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 to contribute to the recovery. So, so that is important. The governments do have a role here, definitely, in, in, in put, putting laws in place, you know, and so on. And that's something that sometimes that's necessary, definitely. You know, that's really important. But I think also... The, the other thing is that that education is is essential you know for for everyone uh, that that the people become aware of you know the implications of this i do think it's it's the implications are now coming through you know we're seeing the effects we've been predicting this you know, all of us yourself and myself and many others for maybe 30 40 years you know of this issue and the problems related to it but, um, you know, people just ignored us because they couldn't see any difference. The birds are still singing in the trees, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Things still, you know, the tr they, you know, autumn comes, then we get summer and everything seems fine. But, but now people are beginning to see the impacts of, uh, of what we've been talking about. And I think that's a, a big reality shock to them, you know, um, you know, significantly so. I think, you know, that, I think the, the argument is being won now in the hearts and minds of the average person, you know, that they're seeing that. And, and I think the pressure, I think we underestimate the pressure of the, 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 the average citizen. Yeah, you know, their vote may not count sometimes, but their actions will count. And if they don't buy those products, you know, that, that's a very strong message to, to anyone. We're also seeing some morality in the whole thing. I was really pleased to see one of the big mining companies, I won't name any of these companies, but, you know, the, the, their chief executive resigned because of damage done to a sacred site, you know, in, in, in Australia. And I thought that was actually really admirable. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we, must, we mustn't get, we mustn't think that these companies are completely, you know, not corrupt, but, you know, I mean, completely cold. I think there are people, uh, you know, in, in senior positions who do care and who have got um, you know, uh, uh, a heart that's, that, that links to the planet uh, like, like, like we all should have. And, um, you know, I think that exists in everyone. We just need to awaken it. It's about awakening that heart, <laughs> that, 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 that relationship again um, to, to uh, understand, you know, how it all works. But yeah, I mean, you know, bottom line is that, you know, companies are there to make money, uh, a profit for, share, for shareholders and so on. But we're finding more and more shareholders are actually now, you know, um, forcing their boards to actually make better decisions. You know, and this is this is happening as well. So I think it's, you know, it's not all negative on the business side at all. I do think there's some, you know, some very good people now rising to the top. Um, there's a greenwashing goes on, of course, you know, that, you know, that's just the game. But uh, but I do think there are some very strong signs, you know, of um of positive progress yeah, in the economic sector. Okay. Uh, I would now like to uh, ask you um, some personal uh, questions. Uh, yeah. How do you uh, have uh, traveled down to this field to protect the planet? Who have been your gurus? Uh, or say um, climate change issues, uh, who have inspired you? Uh, how have you landed in this job? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's a really interesting question. My 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 mom, my mother is was is an artist. She's a beautiful oil painter, amazing artist, and uh, and and she used to take me out. She always painted natural scenes, you know, nature. And I was a small kid. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd see her paint these beautiful um forests and rivers and so on and and i have a I, i've always wanted to be an artist but i'm useless i'm terrible i can't paint at all <laughs> it's, a, it's really i've been to all sorts of classes and i've never been able to learn how to do it but i i, I love art and i think her artistic side uh, has, has has come to me in terms of just 
um, I don't know, uh, enjoying the beauty of nature really and, and looking deeper into it. An artist has to look, you know, in a different way at a landscape to really bring it to life. You know, they look very deeply into it. And then uh, on the other side, uh, um, I had a biology teacher, an amazing man at, at secondary school. And he, you know, he had the biggest effect on me. He's a lovely man, very gentle, softly spoken, but a real burning passion for ecology and um, for biology. And he had a huge impact. And that I started to do research when I was very young, maybe about 11 in our local stream, local river uh, that flowed by, by my house um, where we lived in Northern Ireland. And uh, it was a place of peace. Northern Ireland was at war. We had terrible war in the 1970s when I was growing up. There were bombs going off. off. My family business was blown up in a bomb, you know. Um, but uh, I went to this river and I had peace there. Um, and uh, But also my biology knowledge was growing. And so I began to, you know, really enjoy this place. I've, I've always viewed biology as a peaceful thing because of this time in my childhood, you know, when I could go there on my own away from the, all yeah. the military things and the helicopters and the explosions. And I could just find peace uh, in this beautiful little river. <laughs> and uh, so, what you know, is the, the name river, of the river? The river what was is the name the of the river? Yeah, it was called the Folly River, F-O-L-L-Y. -L -L it's a tiny yeah. little river. It flows into another river, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, uh, it was uh, yeah, the huge impact on me, you know, in Aramaa, where I lived, Aramaa City. Um, and then the only other aspect, I would add, I don't want to waste too much time in this, but um, the other thing was in our city, we had a planetarium. It was very unusual. And I used to go and watch the star shows in the big planetarium. And I got really interested in physics at that stage as well. And that drew me into understanding thermodynamics later on. And then the Earth system as a complex system and energy flow. And so I, I, that brought together then um, a sort of a cosmic view of the planet and that it's 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 part of a bigger thing with the sun and the you know the the thermodynamics the energy flow and all of this in, in the 70s combined. in the 70s yeah. or in the early uh, in the late 60s this was all the yeah, early 70s early 70s yeah, early 70s, yeah. yeah. okay <laughs> yeah that's right so uh and then you know, the rest of it yeah the um, Istokum just, convention <laughs> Yes, sure. it's funny. It was these different <laughs> things. You know, my yeah. artist mother, my river experience, and then the planetarium. And they, they sort of to, um, you know, uh, affect me in, in quite deep ways. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it was an interesting journey, I suppose. And then in the middle of this whole, you know, chaos of the, of the war, you know. Um, so, uh, but yeah, uh, it's... Um, yeah, and, and so since then I've been completely committed to, you know, to the, uh, the ecology and environment. And, yeah. the environment. and then also just the sociological aspect, so importantly as well, you know. Um, but yeah, was, um, uh, it's, um, yeah, and, and so since then I've been completely committed to, you know, to the, uh, the ecology and environment. And, the yeah. environment. and then also just the sociological aspect, so importantly as well, you know. Um, because because you know the, the the two of them are tied together. I think environmental and social sustainability, they, they have to be a, a single aim. You know, um, all together. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was quite amazing that a small river, Polly, mm, uh, yeah. dancing down uh, the terrains, uh, the uplands, uh, and that. Mm, say neighborhood uh, gave you uh, say an amazing amazing inspiration yeah. to come to uh, close to the nature love the ecology environment and planet yeah. and later on i suppose uh, some of your professors some of your uh, say university professors also uh, help you groom up uh, in that tune. Mm, uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's one particular one, Professor John Raven. He's a fellow of the Royal Society in in, in Britain, but uh, he had a massive effect on me as a student. Yeah, I mean, very. He was really into yeah. thermodynamics, yeah. and uh, and so on, phys and ecophysiology. 
and uh, no, he uh, he became my PhD supervisor. Okay. Uh, so uh, I worked under him, which was a real privilege, you know. So that was a terrific experience as well. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I, I started to do field work in Africa and Kenya as part of my PhD. Okay. And that was very important because that took me to a completely different uh, culture uh, and uh, which, which I enjoyed immensely and was greatly affected by the people there in in, in Kenya, you know. Um, yeah. So that, that was a very important part of my PhD, actually, working out there. We're working on uh, um, agroforestry, uh, which is yeah. very interesting. And we were using plants that could provide phosphorus. So, yeah. Freed so up that phosphorus. Is, yeah, so that is in late 70s and early. Yeah, yeah, the my PhD was more was, was um, in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, at the time yeah, I was at, at, uh, doing that, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. And this agroforestry idea, I think, is really interesting, you know, where the trees, we use these trees called Grevillea robusta. They're yeah. an Australian species originally. And uh, they free up phosphorus. They, they free phosphorus up. And then the farmers don't need to buy phosphorus fertilizer uh, yeah. because the phosphorus is naturally yeah. provided in the leaves when they fall. And this is great, you know, uh, and then you would nitrogen fertilize, nitrogen fixing plants in there. And we had a whole combination and there was no need for fertilizers. So it saved a lot of money. A lot of, you know, a lot of the waterways weren't polluted by the, the fertilizers running off. And it was a really beautiful, you know, kind of agricultural system, really. So, you know, which, which is something we can all, I think we need to do. And I think agriculture is one of the biggest issues really on the planet at present, industrial agriculture. And there's so much we can learn from, you know, um, the, these least developed countries, as they're called, you know, who, who have very good agricultural practice yeah. with less fertilizers and, yeah. So, uh, you see, Sorry, yeah. uh, these kind of, uh, say, legendary professors, uh, they have inspired many of us to come uh, to uh, protect our planet. Mm. Uh, and also, they have taught us many, mm, uh, say, interdisciplinary things mm, over the decades. So these legendary mm, people, these le living legends, uh, or say, who have mm, faded away uh, from this universe uh, to away beyond, we should recall them, we should remember them because they have uh, inspired us, they have promoted us, they have bloomed up us uh, in that way uh, mm -hmm. so that we can protect uh, the Mother Earth. Uh, what is, uh, Kate mm, Scanny, your uh, say last message? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, um, we, 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 there is a lot of hope, you know, there, there's a lot of positive things. And so the positive will be the light in the darkness. I really believe that. I, I believe yeah. that we can, all of us, each individual person is, is essentially important in this whole thing. And don't be overwhelmed by big government decisions. Even if COP26 doesn't go well, it, it shouldn't deter us. We need to move. forward positively and and believe that you know we have the right to buy what is good for the planet not buy what isn't um you know make the right decisions one decision at a time and and inspire each other you know and get out into nature feel empowered from nature and and move forward you know and just celebrate being alive in this beautiful planet and let's just you know we can do this we can definitely do this yeah Thank you very, very much, Kate Skenny. It was a pleasure mm, to have this conversation with you. And with your positive note, we would like to end this 46th episode of Climate Conversation of Climate Channel. And hopefully in any other mm, episode, uh, you would be our guest again with that. Uh, we would like to close this episode. Thank you very, very much, Kay, for joining uh, Climate Center, Climate Conversation. Episode. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you, Amro. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.